welcome to Watch Symposium. I'm Austin, and this is the third and final video in a three-part custom video series for V. If you haven't seen the first two videos, links in the description, but in the second video, I talked about what watches he has. Slow my ass, man! He got his panties in a bunch and he just couldn't wait for his AD to get it. What's the rush, man? Come on! Now just to recap, that's the two-tone 43mm Sea Dweller, the ceramic 40mm Date Sub, the two-tone ceramic GMT Master II, the two-tone 42mm Sky Dweller, the Tudor Black Bay Heritage with the red bezel, and the 36mm White Gold Day Date with a diamond dial. All right. In this video, we're going to talk about what he should do going forward. Looking at his current pieces, he has three dive watches. So he's okay on his dive watches. He has two GMT function watches. So he's fine on his travel watches, his GMT function watches. And arguably, he has a dress watch in his 36 millimeter white gold diamond dial day date. But he doesn't have a chronograph. So let's get back to his email and see what he writes. Somewhere in the third quarter of 2020, I let my AD know that I wanted a Cosmograph Daytona reference number 116500LN. That's the black dial ceramic Daytona. And was told both by the manager and salesperson at the AD that I am on top priority and I'll be one of the first ones to receive it after the new year once they receive stock. They stated that they did not have one in stock, and he writes in parentheses, I'll just have to trust them on that, but we're clear in that with my purchase history, they would absolutely put me in priority to obtain this watch. And that's great because you deserve it. You've purchased a two-tone diamond dial ladies watch, one for your mother. You've purchased that 36 millimeter white gold diamond dial day date for yourself and a two-tone piece. So they owe it to you. Just hang tight. I would wait for that. That would be the next thing I did. I wouldn't do anything until I get that steel Daytona. He continues, I have tried on the two-tone Daytona, which just did not seem to me like the oyster steel Daytona did. And I think that's a good thing. I think you have enough two-tone pieces in your collection. I would concentrate on adding steel pieces, unless you just love precious metal pieces and two-tone pieces, and you might, but I would hold out for this steel Daytona. He writes, a colleague at work has one that he bought on the gray market. I cannot see myself spending 25 to 29,000 USD for this watch. And it's interesting because I don't know if he's talking about a two-tone Daytona or the steel Daytona because that's about what you can get, either the two-tone or the steel on the gray market. So I don't know what he's talking about, but don't do it. You've got your relationship with your AD. They say they're going to come through. Just wait, just be patient. Now, before we continue, let me just say that he's got a very modern collection. And so if he wanted to stick with Rolexes, what he could do is use some of his capital, which as we'll see is pretty significant, to go with some vintage pieces or some Nia vintage pieces. Now I throw that out, but I really don't think he is a vintage watch guy. Just looking at his pieces, he's got a lot of two-tone pieces, a lot of blingy pieces. And I made a video about the two types of Rolex people put a link in the description. I think I had a mullet in that video, so check that out. But he, he seems to be uh, more of a, a statement piece kind of guy. And so I can't really see him wanting to get into vintage pieces. But look, there are people that like both gold and two-tone and blingy watches and vintage pieces. You can like both and you can have both. And maybe that's something he could do. Go for some two-tone nipple dial subs or GMTs, but I just have to throw it out there that he's working with a lot of capital here that could be put towards some really amazing collector's pieces. Fat ladies, 1655s, cream dialed Explorer 2s. He has the money to go there. I'm not sure that he wants to. I'm not sure it's really him, but I just have to throw it out there. Now, if he does want to get somewhat of a collectible piece, but wants to stay on the path of modern ceramic pieces, a 116600 40 millimeter sea dweller. That's a steel sea dweller would be great. They didn't make that for very long. I think it's going to be a very collectible piece in the future. It's got the ceramic. It's got the um, you know modern blue perichrome movement. 
And so it's a great, I guess it's considered neo-vintage, even though it's a modern piece because it's discontinued, but it would be something I would consider uh, picking up if I were him because it's not really that much money considering the money he's got to work with and uh, could be collectible. It would bring some steel into that collection. Getting right. back to his email, so with my current collection of the six above mentioned watches and hopefully a new Daytona in the first quarter of 2021, I would likely not buy any other watch until the fourth quarter of 2021 as I want time to enjoy the current collection and want time to ponder my next steps with this beautiful hobby we call horology. And I think that's a great thing to do. Just slow down a bit. We saw that in 2020, he added six watches. So his rate of acquisition has been a little high. He can't really continue that rate of acquisition in the coming years without ending up with dozens of high-end watches, which for some people would be the way to go. For me, I think less is more. I think you really get to know a watch when you wear it. And if you have dozens upon dozens of watches, you really can't spend that quality time with each individual piece. So I think slowing down is a great idea. Wear your pieces, enjoy your pieces, see how your tastes evolve, and be more thoughtful in the coming years on what you want to add, right? And you could always adopt a one-in, one-out policy, or you could just sort of slow down the rate of acquisition, which I think is, is what you're doing. That's where my last question comes in. I'm starting to very much appreciate Patek Philippe and A. Lange Unsun watches, but these are a considerable step up from the Rolex watches I own. And then he writes in parentheses, well, to be fair, the day date wasn't cheap at 38,500 USD. I do like the AP Nautilus. I think you mean the PP Nautilus, the Patek Philippe Nautilus, but cannot see myself spending that kind of money over retail for a hyped up watch. All right, so going hot horology is definitely another option and it could be a good step. You have a lot of Rolexes. You're pretty Rolex heavy, so getting in the hot horology might be the thing you should do after the chronograph, after the Daytona. Now, it would give you a real proper dress watch, you know, a, a dress watch that's hot horology, precious metal on a leather band, and you could go with either of these. I'd be more inclined to go Patek Philippe. I like Swiss watches more, and the brand just resonates with me more. And in the first video, you mentioned the Patek Philippe advertisements. You never actually own a Patek Philippe. You merely look after it for the next generation. That is something you liked, so I would I would go for a Patek if I were you. Which Patek and which Lange should I buy next at the sub 60 to 70,000 USD price point? He adds, I have never bought a pre-owned watch, so not sure if that route is something I should take or would be comfortable taking. If I could have one Lange and one Patek, that should suffice for a while or so, I hope. And I think that's a good idea. Max it out at two hot horology pieces and getting one from each of those brands could be a really good idea. Now, as far as which model you should go for, that's really up to you. As far as the Pateks go, the classic Calatrava is a good idea. I like the sector dials, but to be fair, this is probably sacrilege me saying it, but I think just the regular time and date Calatravas are a little bit boring. I prefer the complicated pieces. I think the travel time's a really nice Patek. I think that's reference 5134. Now, as far as the Lange goes, the Lange One is probably their flagship piece. That's what I would go for. But if you like the Zeitwerk or the Datagraph, I think that's what it's called, more than go that route. That's really up to you. You know, as far as buying pre-owned, that's something you do either when you're trying to really make your money go the furthest, or if you just can't find the pieces except on the gray market. And that was what I faced when I started getting the Rolex because I liked the pre-ceramic models and the five-digit models, and you know they were out of the catalog by then. Rolex had moved on to ceramic pieces, and so I had to go pre-owned. I guess I could have gone new old stock, but that was crazy money. So. Some people do it out of necessity. Some people do it to save a buck or to make their money go further. If I were you, because you're not going to be buying, you know, handfuls of these hot horology pieces, 
I would see if you can find what you want at the AD and that's the way I would go. I would buy these pieces new. You wouldn't have to worry about something being wrong with them. Replaced parts, polished, over-polished, everything would be 100% legit. Now, if you want to throw in 100% with Patek, you could always get one of these nice dress pieces at an AD and that could get your foot in the door for the Nautilus, which you mentioned. And if you could get the Nautilus at list, that would be great. Now, it really depends on where you live. If you live in New York City or LA, it's going to take more than one Calatrava probably. But if you live, you know, in the Midwest and you can find a Patek dealer, buying that one really expensive, you know, sixty to seventy thousand dollar Patek is going to get your foot a lot further in the door than it would in, in one of these big cities where you're competing with some serious high rollers. So if you want to throw in with Patek, that might be a good way to do it. And and I would, and this is after you get the Daytona, buy your Patek. I would buy it new, I would buy it at an AD, and I would make it known that you're interested in the, in the Nautilus. And then while I enjoyed the Patek, I would see if they couldn't get the Nautilus, and if they could, then you could always pick it up. And again, that's one of those pieces you, you buy first and then think about whether you want it later. But enjoy your Patek, and if the Nautilus never comes and you feel like you're ready to get your next hot horology piece, the Lange, well, it'll just give you some time to think about it, and it'll give them some time to perhaps get a Nautilus. And so I would start out with a Patek, all right? And that's a, a good plan. So I think going forward, this is what you should do. Hang tight for the Daytona. Wait for it to come. It will. They owe it to you. I think they know it. And once you get that, enjoy it. Enjoy your pieces. And I would wait until 2022. That's just what I would do. See if your tastes evolve until then. And think about what you want to add in terms of hot horology when that time comes and you feel like you've, you know, thoughtfully decided on what you want. Go to an AD and, and buy your Patek. Mention that you want a Nautilus. Enjoy your Patek. And think to the future. Think about what you want to add and give yourself the time to be thoughtful about it and savor uh, the future purchases. Right? instead of rushing out and trying to achieve all your horological goals because it really is about the hunt. And the idea of sort of achieving, getting to the finish line might seem like a good idea, like something you want, but it wouldn't be a blessing. It would actually be a curse. Things would be really boring. You know, what does the future horologically hold for you if you've got all those pieces? Well, realistically, probably what would happen is that finish line would evaporate before your very eyes and materialize in the future past a piece you didn't even know you needed, but all of a sudden think you do now, right? The goalposts, the finish line would shift. But it's always nice to have something to look forward to in the future. And so trying to get everything you, you need and sort of uh, get to that finish line, it's actually kind of shooting yourself in the foot because you want to you wanna be able to look to the future and say, hmm, I think this might be next, and really savor the journey there. Learn about the piece, read about you know, the, the brand, and I think that's what you should do going forward, all right? And uh, that's your plan right there. Now, guys, let me know if it's good advice. Let me know if this is what he should do. Slow the rate of acquisition. Wait for the Daytona after that perhaps consider hot horology, Patek, get that. Consider a Nautilus, consider a Lange. Take your time, thoughtfully decide, and perhaps add the Nautilus and, and maybe down the road, a Lange for good measure. All right, let me know what you think, guys. Let V know what he should do. Thanks for watching, take care, and I'll see you next time.